everybody. I'm Rick Hansen, a neuropsychologist and author of Hardwiring Happiness. And with Entheos, I'm putting on this series on the loving brain, help for real issues. Uh, I have with me today uh, my friend Paul Gilbert, Professor Paul Gilbert, um, who is a, a world uh, known uh, authority on compassion and uh, I would say the heart, really, uh, both in terms of wounds of the heart and ways to heal the heart. Uh, he's a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Derby and consultant clinical psychologist at the Derbyshire Healthcare Foundation Trust. He has uh, researched evolutionary approaches to psychopathology for over 35 years, with a special focus on shame and the treatment of shame-based difficulties, which we'll be getting into uh, in this uh, interview. Uh, shame-based difficulties are really well served by compassion-focused therapy, which he developed. In 2003, he was president of the British Association of Behavioral and Cognitive uh, Psychologists and an, uh, a member of the first uh, National Institute of Clinical E for Evaluation or something, Depression Guidelines for Depression. In other words, he's been a top authority in his field. Uh, he's written and edited, or edited rather, 20 books and over 150 papers. In 2006, he established the Compassionate Mind Foundation Charity, a nonprofit, with a mission statement to promote well being through the scientific understanding and application of compassion. And you can see that website at Compassion Mind, or rather CompassionateMind.co.uk. That's CompassionateMind.co.uk. Uh, he's awarded an OBE in March 2011, the Order of the British Empire. As a former colonial of the British Empire, I want to just uh, let him know that we will not be fomenting revolution on this call. Uh, Paul's been married for over 35, or approaching 35 years. Uh, his wife is a researcher, is now retired, and they have an adult daughter and son. So welcome, Paul. I'm very, very pleased that we're doing this together. Well, it's delighted to be invited here. Okay, great. So, uh, diving in, if we could, I'll uh, ask you a question that I ask all my guests, which is, why is it important? Why has it been important to you personally to get good to at relationships? I think relationships are really the most important uh, source of well-being. I mean, if you imagine winning, say, a hundred million dollars, and then they tell you you can have the money, but you'll never meet the people you love again. You're going to have to live on your own. You'd probably give up the money. So it tells you that our relationships are really the source of happiness, I think. So that's why uh, relationships for me are so important. And also, when I'm down or distressed, I turn to others. And it's the comfort and kindness of others that really helps get me through those stressful periods. So, Paul, I'm going to swing back to that, that when you're down and stressed, you tend to others. So we're going to swing back to that a little bit later on because... That on the face of it seems a little counterintuitive because people often, you know, are afraid if they will that they'll become depleted if they tend to others when they're stressed or down. Uh, so we're going to come back to that a little bit later on. Um, if you could also say, uh, what's a relationship issue that you faced personally, and how have you dealt with it? Well, I think obviously the, the key relationships are the ones that you experience at work with your work colleagues, and also the ones you experience in your intimate relationships. The fact of the matter is that intimate relationships are both great joys, but they can also have sources of disappointment. So we understand that it's not only how we love each other, but how do we deal with the differences and the conflicts between each other? So I suppose what's tested me and what's helped me grow as an individual is not what we share, but the way in which we're able to work on the things that we don't share, the way in which things can be difficult. And in fact, although compassion is linked to love, the highest forms of compassion are for those aspects of yourself or others that you don't love. If you can be compassionate to those, then you're really in business. So could you, that's beautiful. And uh, we're going to be coming back to that theme and point quite a bit here. But if you're willing, I'm going to push a little bit, even though you're British and you don't normally talk about this sort of thing. But how about you personally? Uh, you just talked about issues at work and at home and compassion for the parts you don't like too much. I mean, to the extent you're willing to be a little public about this, um, how have you applied to yourself uh, some of what you've known? Well, I think probably 
the, one of the things I'm not so keen on myself is that I have a habit of putting myself under time pressure, of taking on too many things, and then I start getting frustrated and irritable when I run out of time, when I've got this to do and this to do and this to do. Um, so uh, these are not uh, good habits. So what I try and do then is just to remind myself to slow down and to focus on the fact that, you know, I, I got myself into this mess with good intention. Uh, and I think learning how to be compassionate, particularly uh, when you become irritable or angry, is really quite important because those are aspects of ourselves that we feel quite unlovable and then we feel bad about it and then we become critical of the fact we got angry and then we're angry because we're critical. And so, <laughs> just by, by learning to slow down and just gentle and kind with oneself, uh, that really does help uh, place it in its context, I think. That's great. That's really great. Well, speaking of context, uh, you've done really interesting and groundbreaking work that embeds uh, psychopathology, which is a kind of scary word. I really want to broaden it out and talk about suffering or, or dysfunction, uh, especially related to uh, issues like shame. And as you well know, that's on a spectrum, of course, uh, from sort of a wince of guilt all the way out to devastating self-loathing. Uh, and then related issues of depression, which tend to interact with shame in a kind of negative spiral, if you will, a vicious cycle. So you've done very interesting work that embeds those issues uh, that comprise so much of our suffering in an evolutionary context. You know, you're really talking about the evolution in some sense of suffering, especially suffering related to relationships. So if you could just take a few minutes here and create that framework for us uh, as to why in the world it would be useful to think about our everyday experiences of self-criticism or inadequacy or worthlessness or a blue mood in an evolutionary context. How is that a helpful framework for us? Uh, well, that's a great question. I mean, the, the key point really is that when we begin to suffer, particularly with depressions and uh, problems such as drinking or the use of drugs, people often become very self-critical and self-disliking. Now, by understanding the way in which our brains operate, we can begin to see that much of what goes on in our mind is not our fault. It's not our design. We didn't choose it. So we all just found ourselves here as an embodied mind. And this mind has been evolving over many millions of years. So you have a mind which has many motivations and many emotions which are millions of years old, which you share with other animals. But you also have a mind that's capable of thinking. So unlike other animals, you'll never see a chimpanzee sitting under a tree taking their pulse and thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have a heart attack. Or, or looking into the lake and thinking, have I put on weight? But humans do. Because humans have this capacity to think and judge and become an object to themselves. Mm. And that's useful, except when it becomes critical. And then the self becomes an, an enemy to itself. And that then takes us into the territory of shame. And unfortunately, uh, many commentators have noted that Westerners in particular tend to do a lot of judging and rating of themselves. Uh, usually critically, feeling they're not up to it, they're not good enough, they should be this or they should be like this, they should be able to control their weight, they should be able to control their diet, whatever it is. And that self-criticism then becomes quite a powerful, uh, has a quite a powerful effect on people's threat and stress systems. And of course, it also cuts them off from feeling uh, connected and affiliative with others. So the evolutionary context shows us that actually all the stuff that goes on in our head it's not our fault. We didn't choose it. We didn't design it. Um, and if we can stop blaming and shaming, then we can stand back and start taking responsibility for the kinds of minds we find that we've got. And that takes us into your territory, of course, Rick, which is mindfulness and how to be compassionate to the inner states of ourselves. Right. That's very interesting. Okay. So, um, you know, we have evolution, we're mammals, right, who then became primates, hominids, and humans, right? Uh, to use the lyric from the Grateful Dead song, what a long, strange trip it's been. Uh, and then in that context, much as we evolved uh, senses and an opposable thumb and physical things like organ systems and so forth, because they helped pass on genes, we also evolved social 
tendencies and social capabilities like empathy, for example, or language that we're using right here and so on. And then in the context of all that, we also acquired certain emotions, emotions that also helped us survive in a variety of ways that conferred what are called reproductive advantages so we could more effectively pass on our genes while evolving in fairly small bands that bred largely internally, especially at the human stage of evolution. And so in that context then, now that you've created a frame as to why it's useful to think about it like this, could you talk about what might have been the reproductive advantages, as it were, the social, the survival benefits of these painful emotions. You know, why would we evolve painful emotions like shame or guilt or depression? And why would we evolve uh, such a vulnerability, uh, such an inclination to self-criticism? What Can you help us understand how that, in some sense, was sensible from Mother Nature's standpoint, even though today it creates very painful issues in terms of quality of life? Okay, well, this is a really uh, fundamental question that goes to the heart of the evolutionary story, right? which is that many things that evolve are not necessarily adaptive. They are what we call trade-offs, right? So the, uh, the, the genes for sickle cell anemia, which is a horrible disease, but they convey uh, protection to malaria. So you can have an advantage in one area, but it will cause a disadvantage in another area. The human female has the most dangerous and painful births of all primates because in standing up, the birth canal moves slightly forward because that gave uh, hands-free, we had a hands-free we could see, fantastic advantage, but the disadvantage was in how humans give birth. So the key thing is recognizing that an advantage in one area can be a huge disadvantage in another. So this is how it works in the human brain. Well, this is one way it works. We say, you know, imagine there is a zebra running away from a lion, and the zebra gets away eventually, and the lion gives up. Within a very short period of time, the zebra will go back to grazing, go back to the herd and grazing as if nothing's happened. This won't happen to a human, because human has this thinking brain. So the human will start imagining what could have happened if they'd got caught that they might have been choked to death by this lion, what it would be like to be eaten alive, all the other lions pouncing on you. They wake up in the middle of the night, oh my God, supposing there are two lions tomorrow, oh my God. So what happens is our thinking brain then starts to put us into a loop where we become anxious and then we think, oh my God, what if, and suppose that, and maybe, and oh dear. Okay, so this brain, which is wonderful for uh, solving problems and being very creative and makes us intelligent, allows us to talk together on the internet, can also literally drive us crazy. So anxiety and depression often comes because we get into loops that we can't get out of. Those loops can be self-critical loops or they can be loops about uh, anxiety. They can also be loops that are linked to anger and vengeance. And that's an interesting and important because Humans are potentially very, very cruel, and they can be very, very cruel because their mind gets into a loop of vengeance, and when that happens, other things get turned off. So in your work as well, we know that attention not only puts things into a spotlight, you know, when you're focusing on your left foot, you're not aware of your fingers, but it also puts things into darkness. So when you become focused on vengeance, empathy and compassion starts to get turned off, and that's... That, that's not a design feature, it's just the way it is. That's, a, that's a, what we call a trade-off in the human brain. So you get advantages in one area, but you can get huge disadvantages in another. Even though we're clever, right, we're not really adapted to build nuclear weapons, but we do. Mm. There's no evolutionary advantage in that. In fact, it might be a disaster at the end of the day. Uh, it's just a trade-off. It's just an unforeseen, unfortunate consequences of the evolution of this capacity for thinking, having a sense of self, wanting to defend the sense of self, defend one's you know territory and all that. Right. Um, so we have here a framework, I think, which is so helpful for people because evolution has now become a new narrative structure, really, uh, I think, uh, in the culture and for a lot of individuals. As, as you know, it's been... 
uh, very helpful uh, in my own interests and for me personally too. Uh, and as you say, it's helpful to realize that we have these tendencies that are rattling around inside of our head. I, I think of the inner menagerie, you know, the lizard, the mouse, and the monkey, as well as a variety of other little creatures. Uh, I read recently that uh, this little tiny roundworm, uh, C. elegans, that's a millimeter long with 302 neurons, uses oxytocin. Uh, to guide mating decisions, even though we diverged from them certainly several hundred million years ago in terms of common ancestors between humans and this tiny little roundworm with 302 neurons compared to our own 100 billion. So, so in that context, we have various uh, functions and capabilities that confer direct survival advantages, like being able to stand upright, which then had um, a downside. You know, there was the collateral damage, if you will, the cost that went with the benefit. Uh, we also have various um, capabilities that are purely fortuitous. They're just accidental, spandrels, you know, as you know they're called. But a little more specifically though, uh, you know, I've read uh, scholars who have advanced the argument that, for example, social emotions like shame co-evolved with the evolution, of, if you will, of altruism. Because if you don't have some concern about reputation, uh, that then allows freeloaders to take advantages and it undermines um, the importance of cooperation and altruism uh, in a social environment. So going through a, a shame process uh, is a way to help uh, bind the band together and therefore it confers direct advantages. It's not merely an unfortunate side effect of various other beneficial processes. Well, the other thing being that um, uh, if you have a, a sense of shame, it's a way to kind of go through these rituals of healing and reconciling in an interpersonal conflict uh, in a band in which there could be, you know, lethal, uh, con you know, results if you don't knuckle under and go beta. So revealing shame is a way to reveal beta and it's to, you know, in a funny kind of way, it's to communicate trust. You know, you can trust me because I feel remorseful about screwing up here. Uh, and going forward. So uh, also depression, people have talked about it as a very common symptom of illnesses and injuries because it makes the critter hunker down, whimper under the bushes to heal rather than going out uh, with impaired capacity. So in that sense too, depression could have some kind of direct adaptive function. Uh, so I wonder if you wanted to comment on that or not, and then we'll just keep going. Uh, well, there's a lot there to, to think about. Yes, yeah. I mean, so think, the thing about depression, right, the first thing is then we have what we call evolutionary functional analysis. Now, that sounds terribly technical, but what it means is we try to under, understand the function of a mood state or an emotion. So the function of anxiety is to make you, is to help you detect a threat and then run away. Yeah. The function of anger is to help you detect a threat and then engage to try and get rid of it. So what is the function of lowering your capacity for positive emotion? Why would you want to do that? Mm -hmm. And so as you pointed out, there are two, at least two, uh, reasons for doing that socially. There are other non-social reasons. But one is we see that children who are separated from their parents, and this is in primates and rats as well, yeah. um, for a period of time they show what we call protests. They become anxious, they cry, they search to find a reunion to the parents. The problem is if they keep doing that, they will become dehydrated, uh, they will become exhausted, they will get lost, and they will attract predators. So a second defensive system switches in, which is to cause them to hunker down. And they literally go into what is called a despair state. This is John Bolton's work, yeah. where they, they do, as you say, close up and hunker down because they're going to then stay put, they're not going to get so dehydrated, and as you say, they'll go into the bushes and they won't attract predators. And what's very important is, of course, for many mammals, they locate their young through smell. So that the animal doesn't have to be signaling by noise, it can be detected through cell, cell, uh, smell. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, to, to hunker down in a potentially hostile environment where there are no protectors, right, this is a very common source of feeling depressed. People often feel depressed when they feel socially isolated, they don't have any friends, there's nobody to turn to, they may feel anxious in the environments that they're in. And if that continues for a period of time, then the positive emotion systems start to take a dive because they're literally going into this state. Now, ideally, of course, uh, originally, that was to keep them safe in a potentially threatening environment. So that's one element. And when you talk to depressed patients, that's exactly what they feel. They say, yes, I feel cut off, I feel slowed up, 
I feel I, I can't make a connection with anybody. There's no one that can help me. So that system seems to be important there. The shame system is another system which is really interesting because what we see in shame behavior is the same nonverbal communication that we see in submissive behavior. And the submissive signal is to send to others, listen, I, I recognize my lowly position. I recognize uh, that I've done something wrong, like, <laughs> uh, like a primate. If it looks intently at a dominant, if it gazes at a dominant, a dominant will say that as a threat and then will attack the subordinate. If the subordinate submits and makes a submissive sign, it can divert the... Paul, let me interrupt you. Sorry, you just said something important. I want to just kind of flag it uh, for people's clarity. That yep. if the gaze in a primate band to a dominant uh, yep. animal could promote or, or trigger an attack by... Yep. The, yeah, so keep going, please. Yeah, that's right. And of course, you sometimes see that with aggressive males, don't you? If they're in a, a drinking bar and they look at each other, one of them will say, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? You know. So eye gaze can be quite a, a threat signal uh, in some context. So the submissive position is to say, look, I recognize that I don't want to be a threat to you, so I'm, I'm hunkering down. And that usually then protects the animal from being uh, seriously injured or hurt. So submissive behavior is a behavior that we often use in the context where we feel some kind of threat from others, be it physical threat or the threat of rejection or the threat of criticism or whatever it is. The interesting thing about shame, though, is it's a very self-focused emotion, okay? So it's about the self. It's about me. So if you imagine two people having an affair, Tom and Harry, and their wives discover it, and Tom thinks, oh, no, my wife's now going to not like me anymore. She'll think I'm a bad person. And it's true. I shouldn't have done it. I am a bad person. That's all shame. Guilt, on the other hand, comes from a very different emotional system, which is actually linked to caring and compassion. And this requires the person to understand the other, what they've done to the other, to be in touch with the pain they've caused the other. And that then motivates not anxiety and hunkering down, but it motivates a very different behavior, which is to open up and say, look, I want to try and repair this. I'm very sorry. My heart is, you know, I feel terrible remorse. You don't necessarily feel remorse and shame, but guilt you do. So the shame element is, is part and parcel of self-protection. And this is why in depression, it often is toxic because it's closing the individual down as if they're under some kind of threat. They feel worthless. They feel low rank. They feel, uh, you know, nobody really uh, will like them. It's very self-focused. Whereas feeling guilty is about recognizing the harm that we do other people with a motivation to try to do something about it, to put it right, to genuinely empathically attune to the harm that you do. Now, if you're an individual who can work with guilt, that you don't kind of get overwhelmed by it and become shamed, this is a very important thing because we learn that we don't hurt people because we genuinely don't want to. Because genuinely, if we upset people, we shout at them or are unkind to them, it makes us sad. So the, the, the emotions that you're talking about are incredibly important. So you have the hunkering down that you can get when you feel isolated and unloved. You have the hunkering down when you feel weak and inferior and unlovable. But the guilt aspect is about opening yourself up and recognizing that all of us from time to time do do hurtful things. But if we just own up to that, try and put it right as best we can, and make a decision, I don't want to do that again, um, then we can move forward. And that is what builds relationships. And as you were saying earlier, you know, in a relationship, if you have had an argument and you've said hurtful things, but your partner recognizes that you feel genuine remorse, okay, uh, it's likely to help the relationship repair. If, on the other hand, your partner thinks you're only being nice to me because you feel bad, you feel terrible, and you're wanting to make yourself feel better, you want me to forgive you so that you'll feel better. That kind of apology doesn't work so much. So you've got to feel that the other person has a genuine sadness of what they've done, and then your apology might be accepted. <laughs> well, that, that's fantastically useful. Uh, 
For me personally, as well as I think just as content, to distinguish between this shame, submission, depression, withdrawal symptom, or system rather, generally, from this guilt, uh, remorse, uh, approach system that's more about reconciliation and repair and recreating a foundation of trust that supports altruism, cooperation, and so forth. And uh, a little bit later, we'll get to some practical things people can do uh, to help themselves. Yes. As yes. it were, it seems like in general, is to get out of shame and into guilt, in a sense. Yes, absolutely. And how that's, to make those that's distinctions. So in, that's so important, because guilt is very self-focused, really. Okay, I, sorry, I beg your pardon. Shame is very self-focused, right? It's about, I feel bad, I've done bad, I am bad, me, 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 me. Whereas guilt mm -hmm. is outwardly focused, you know, of recognizing the harm that you've done. That you're empathically in tuning and recognizing, oh, I didn't, you know. And it brings us back to something I think we're going to talk about later, is that when you become compassionately focused, that your true intention is to try as much as you can to become a compassionate person in the world because that sorts out this crazy brain, as we've discussed. But also, when you come to that true intent to be compassionate, you are much more able to recognize that sometimes you, you, you will hurt people and the way to uh, engage that is just to be absolutely honest and upfront about it and do what you can to, uh, you know, genuinely put it right. Yeah. Uh, people might be listening to this or watching this uh, in the way I am, and it reminds me actually of reading uh, textbooks in grad school about, uh, you know, suffering and distress and dysfunction. Uh, there was an intellectual track that was fascinated by it and absorbing a lot of material. And then there's kind of an underlying personal track that is recognizing some of the implications here and sorting through my own history um, around shame distinct from guilt and the distinction between shame being kind of a withdrawal, self, morbid self-preoccupation almost, whereas guilt, remorse moving me more into proactive repair, moving forward, future focused, if you will, uh, and, and feeling into the value personally of that distinction, even as intellectually my brain's exploding with how interesting this material is. So one last uh, bit of a conceptual framework, if we can, and then we'll really segue into practical applications. You have this model of three systems, motivational, emotional, drive systems, if you will. And that's been a very useful framework for you and for others for thinking about um, the mind-brain in an evolutionary frame, as well as kind of how to hook like a Christmas tree or sort of a skeleton under which to hang different interventions uh, for different needs in these different systems, if you will. So if you could just walk us through your three systems and how they're applied practically, that would create a framework and then we can go forward more into the tools part of this conversation. Okay, so um, this, is, uh, this is a great, great question because um, we know that the brain does uh, specific things, we call it evolutionary function analysis, and one of the things it must do is to detect threats and then take rapid actions, right? So your threat system is your most important system. It's very easy to activate within you. There's a whole series of brain systems absolutely dedicated to processing threat. Mm -hmm. Now your threat system, if you're not careful, will control your mind. We give an example such as you go Christmas shopping and in ten shops. In nine of the shops the assistant is really helpful and kind, but in one shop the assistant is really rude. They try and sell you something you don't want and then they give you the wrong change, the wrong money back at the end of it. And you come out of the shop and you're really a bit annoyed about that. So who do you think about when you go home? Okay. Even though 90% of the people have been really kind to you, and if you remembered them and focused on them, remembered their smiling faces, you'd feel good, even though that's true, you probably don't. You go home and you start talking about the one that really annoyed you. Yeah. Now, the thing about that is that it's not just that they've annoyed you, but you'll be stimulating your body in certain kinds of ways as you're rehearsing how angry you are and should you write to the store manager and, you're telling your partner and their partner's getting angry. It's like, yes, I don't know how they employ these people. So the point is, even though 90% of what happened to you was great, this, this one event. So the, 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 the threat system is designed to be like this. It is designed to take control of your mind if you let it, right? And this is the importance of becoming mindful and being aware. 
what you're doing. So that's the threat system. But you actually have two very different types of positive emotion. And I remember when I was reading this for the first time, it was just like being hit on the head with a hammer. Because I'd always seen positive emotion and negative emotion as two things. I'd never really realized that actually it's even more important to distinguish between two types of positive emotion than between positive emotion and threat. So the first positive emotion is the emotion which is associated with joy and excitement and pleasure. So as we go back to the idea is if you won the lottery and you're worth a hundred million dollars, you're going to get a buzz of dopamine so great that you're going to not be able to sleep for a few days at least. One of my patients who was paranoid said, oh, no, Dr. Gilbert, he said, no, I'd be thinking about all the people who would want to kill me for my money. <laughs> but generally speaking, yeah. this would give you a buzz. So this system is the system which in the West in particular is being stimulated all the time. Excitement doing, excitement doing, ratings. Television programs want to make sure they excite you. The worst thing to do is to bore you. They must not bore you. That's terrible. So this system is a very, very powerful system, and it's sympathetic arousal. Most of your threat system is sympathetic arousal. Most of your drive system is sympathetic arousal. It's gene you up, gene you up, gene you up. Geeing? Uh, uh, speeding, geeing, you know. Oh, okay, got it, geeing. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You got it there. Uh, so it's an exciting, it's an activating to put your heart rate up, blood pressure up, all that stuff, breathing rate up. But there's another system which is associated with a peaceful sense of well-being, which is associated with the calming down. And this uses a part of your autonomic nervous system called the parasympathetic system, which you've written about, I know. And this system is a very different type of positive emotion indeed. This system gives much different clarity of thought. It allows for reflective thought. It has open attention. And it allows the body to uh, relax and regenerate. It's, it's, it's great for allowing the body to heal. Now, this system is a system that people sometimes find quite difficult to activate because if you try to help them start to slow down, maybe become mindful doing nothing. They actually get agitated as if they must have some sympathetic buzz. They've got to have buzz, you know. So the, this system of contented well-being and how we promote contented well-being is, I think, a very big issue in the West. It's a very important issue for our children because at the moment what we're doing to our children is constantly stimulating them and we're not teaching them how to let the body slow down, how to find points of contentment. Uh, and if you can find contentment in your life, um, that's a pretty good thing. Okay, great. So a couple things there. Um, we have this distinction between the threat system and we have these two different kinds of positive emotion linked yeah. to uh, activating um, positive emotions, sometimes people call them vitality affects, like excitement or joy or enthusiasm, passion, and so forth, I have more sympathetic nervous system arousal, whereas yeah. uh, contentment, uh, calm, peaceful well-being, more around parasympathetic uh, activation, uh, first branch of the vagus nerve, kind of yeah. calming, soothing. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, just to make a little point, that um, when you're sympathetically aroused, even with positive emotion, it's a short hop to negative emotion. In other yeah. words, it's pretty easy to go from excitement about your sports team winning a match to irritation at the person elbowing you next next to you who spills beer on you. Whereas on the other hand, if you're in peaceful well-being with a lot of parasympathetic activation, it's kind of hard to move from that to a total freeze in terror response, which would be like an extreme of parasympathetic activation. So I think of uh, sympathetic activation as a, it's great. Uh, I like it a lot myself, uh, but it's a bit of a yellow flag condition because it's easy to tip into fight or flight when you're already aroused, you know, it's a detail. Uh, but it, could you talk about your other two systems as well, um, especially the third system? Well, the content system, this, the, yeah. just what we green system. Yeah. I think the point that you just made is a really, really important one. The other interesting point about the drive system, before we talk about the green system, is that what happens if you bought it. So you, you're, I don't know, your team is winning, they've made a touchdown, and then with five minutes to go, the other team make a comeback, and then the bell goes and they win. 
Okay. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. So the the interesting thing is, if you thwart the drive system, then you can have these collapses and these disappointments and so on. Yeah. So it's it's a really good point that you make that you can easily hop from drive into threats, into disappointment, into irritation, into frustration, because the drive system doesn't like to be thwarted. The other thing that's really interesting is the way in which um, we um, uh, experience um, the, the movement between uh, drive and threat. So people who feel quite threatened, they feel quite lonely and that sort of thing, um, these individuals can very easily start to use drive. If I achieve something, if I do something, then the people will love me. Uh, if I show that I can do this, then I should be worth something. So that's using the drive strategy for what is basically an affiliative problem. So we say we use the, the drive strategy for what is really to do with feeling contentment and connected. That's the key. That's the that's the key thing for um, uh, the, the the green system, as we call it, the parasympathetic system. So Paul, let me just sort of interrupt you again. Uh, so we have these three systems. Okay, and I'll do it like this, kind of three floors of a house almost. So we have yeah. this threat system down here. Uh, yeah. Then we have a drive system, which uses a lot of sympathetic nervous system activation. Okay. Yeah. I'm assuming also the threat system, uh, as you say, is very loaded on sympathetic arousal, yeah. fight or yeah. flight. Although it must also use a certain amount of parasympathetic activation, if need be, for freezing responses, right? Yeah. And yeah. then we have this contentment system, which is very socially focused, but also draws upon some of those nice aspects of the parasympathetic nervous system uh, for calming and peacefulness, serenity, well-being, and so forth, right? So we have these three systems where we have threat, drive, and contentment. All right. And you were just talking about how sometimes people use the drive system to solve issues that are really in the contentment system. Yeah. It's like yeah. using a hammer to pound in a screw. So can yeah. you say more about that? And yes. what people can kind of, this will be probably a segue into how to use compassion uh, and self-compassion to move out of inappropriate, if you will, drive-based solutions to what really is a contentment or interpersonal problem. Yeah. Uh, you put it much better than I did. <laughs> I've been listening to you for a while, so it's easy for me to summarize it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, people who uh, feel, for one reason or another, uh, inferior or inadequate or not good enough, often try and prove themselves. So like they're monitoring all the time, how am I doing, how am I doing? The problem is that the the problem begins with the feeling of not feeling good enough, feeling disconnected, feeling not really lovable at the heart of them. Yeah. So they try and earn it, you see, I'm going to earn it. That's I'm going to okay. earn it, right. I'm going to earn it, I'm going to earn love, I'm going to earn, I'm going to earn it, I'm going to prove my worth, right? Yeah. With the drive Pro system, in other words. With the drive system by do-do-doing, and then we end up rushing, rushing, rushing everywhere. Sounds like my culture. <laughs> And mine, I'm afraid. Sounds like my day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, the problem is then, not, not only when we get disappointed, are we disappointed, but we feel more threatened because we go back into feeling inadequate. So it's a double whammy, that. So there's one Whoa. thing to be disappointed because, you know, you're disappointed, you want to achieve, you wanted to pass your exam, you didn't pass it. But if you have this kind of drive, if you don't pass your exam, then you go back to feeling inadequate and bad again. Now, many of our people that we see in the clinic, as you know, they cycle between this. They're doing okay as long as they're successful, and then life gives them a defeat or a setback, and then they fall back into depression again, and they, they feel they can't manage it, they can't do it. So, you're quite right. The problem is you're never going to solve the problem of acceptability, of connectedness, of lovability that way. Drive through In, drive methods. Through only through drive methods. Drive only methods. Drive. Okay. How do you create this internal experience of being content and okay with where you are and what you are right now? Okay. So you're not struggling to be something other. You're not struggling to prove yourself to you know to catch up to be you know a different kind of person in a way. So that's a story, of course, that you've written about many, 
many times about how do you get to this point of centeredness, of learning to be accepting of yourself as you are. Because if you can begin to accept yourself as you are, um, then you'll find that other people are going to relate to you in different ways because you're going to be calmer, you're going to be more focused on them, not on you, and the whole ball game changes. Wow. So that's a great segue. So just to kind of quick recap, uh, we have these three systems, right? Threat, uh, drive, and contentment. And you made, to me, the eye-popping point that people very often try to get their contentment needs, which are quite socially saturated, which you're going to get into momentarily, to, to meet their contentment needs through drive approaches. The problem with that is, one, it's like using a hammer to pound in a screw. Also, drive, when it's thwarted, pushes people, activates that threat system, yeah. uh, and also can take people into that place of slumping, uh, yeah. which goes then to what we said earlier, you said earlier, about shame and yeah. withdrawal and collapse. So yeah. drive is a tricky uh, solution to life's problems, and to make the explicit point that people have probably been thinking about it implicitly, our culture really, really emphasizes um, drive-based solutions to life's problems. It's a culture based on drive. Uh, and so we have a lot of messages around us, and in a funny kind of way, we can feel inadequate if we're not zooming along like everybody else. Uh, if you're not busy, you must not be important, right? So maybe this will be a good segue into using compassion-based methods to help oneself. Uh, what would you do with someone who says essentially, but wait a second, people love me because of what I accomplish, because of what I produce through drive. And that's the only way to be loved. I must pile up accomplishments. I need to pile up merit badges of various kinds to be worth anything to other people. That's the message I got maybe as well when I was growing up. That was the message I got in school. That's what I see on TV every day. The ads, the really cool people are amazingly accomplished and special and they have perfect skin, unlike me. So, you know, what do I do, doctor? Okay, well, the first thing is, um, are you happy with that? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? I wouldn't be here if I was happy. Exactly. So although you... Why do you think I'm paying you so much money? <laughs> we we need to hike your fees. I think you're not paying me enough. Okay, so <laughs> you think, firstly, so the patient recognizes, yeah, yeah, I can see that, but I, I also intuit there's something wrong with it, see? Yeah. So the point is, you generally point out that they don't love you. They love what you give them. They love what you can provide them. They probably don't even know much about you because you're so busy just giving them things that they can focus on the things that you're giving them. The other point, which is something we should talk about, is that there are many people who use what we call the submissive drive, where they're trying to be kind to people and nice to people because you're going to like me. So I'm going to always be submissive and do what you want me to do and always be there for you. And that can look like compassion, but actually it isn't. It's, it's a kind of caring in order to be liked and to be wanted. In fact, we've just done some research on it. So the issue is then helping the person to think about, well, but supposing you couldn't do it anymore for one reason or another, you got injured or something happened or you get old or whatever, what happens then? Okay, how are you going to feel then? Are you destined to be depressed and unhappy? Or is there another way in which you can learn to find your way in the world, to find a meaningful life, and to be happy with the way things are right now without having to achieve and do? Great, achieve and do is wonderful. And if you succeed and do loads of things, be happy with the thing. Okay, so the thing is okay. But if you turn it about doing a good thing makes me a good person, that's when we get into trouble, okay? Uh, Albert Ellis used to talk about the Sunday painters, um, and he gave a wonderful example where there would be two types of painter, right? And one painter would go into the park, and they'd be painting, and they'd enjoy the sunshine, smell the air, and they'd put this uh, paint on the canvas, and they'd look at the trees, and they'd notice the colors, and uh, the other painter would go to the park and be painting, and then would start thinking, I wonder what people are thinking about my painting. They probably think I'm no good at painting. Maybe that's true, actually. Now I come to think of it, this is not a very good painting. Actually, I'm no good at painting. Why am I doing this painting? I'm going home. 
Okay, so many people in life kind of are like the Sunday painters. They're constantly judging, how well am I doing? Is this good enough? Is this okay? Have I given you enough? As opposed to living life in the moment, paying attention to the what you're doing. So enjoy the activity of painting for the activity of painting, not because it's going to impress people and they're going to love you because you're a great painter. That's okay, but that's not really going to give you the joy of painting. The joy of painting comes from the activity, not from the result. And uh, the result you may never like, but the activity you might. Yeah. What are some of the um, most powerful methods you know, especially experiential ones, to help people who are really burdened by strong self-criticism, maybe a legacy of childhood wounds as well, and are coming to you with depression or shame? Um, part of what you offer, of course, is a new way of looking at things, a new perspective. I mean, you make the point implicitly, again and again, wonderfully, that you cannot get enough of what you don't really want, right? So it's kind of a doomed strategy as well as a very painful and yeah. self, uh, you know, mortifying one, if you will. Uh, okay, so you, you introduce that idea for people, you help people understand, you know, give them, that's conceptual cognitive methods, if you will, and use that as a rationale to interrupt some of their cognitive processing. Yeah. In addition to that, what are maybe some of your maybe top three uh, takeaways that people could use with themselves or if they're in a helping profession could use with others that are maybe more experiential even, uh, you know, practices of various kinds. Uh, that could help people move out of being trapped in drive with self-criticism or even collapsed, you know, into shame uh, and heal themselves and feel better and, uh, uh, you know, draw on the power of compassion. Okay, this is a great question. Like, give me a couple of moments because I want to take you through a story, right? Mm -hmm. And the story is this. <clears throat> this is how we, when we're working with patients, this is how we do it in our groups. The first thing we say to them is, Supposing I could take your criticism away so that you would never be angry, you would never beat yourself up again, how would that be for you? What would be your greatest fear of actually not having that kind of angry voice in your head from time to time? And many people say, oh, well, then I'd become lazy and I'd become arrogant and I wouldn't achieve my goals and I need to hit myself from time to time to keep myself going. So we say, okay, so you feel then the self-criticism has a point, has a use for you? And they say, yeah, yeah, I think so. So then we say to them, well, we're going to show you that it doesn't. So what we ask them to do is to think of something they don't like about themselves and then to sit quietly and imagine they can see that critic outside of them. Just imagine what it looks like, what form does your self-criticism take, and quite often, it's either themselves or the hostile voice pointing finger, or it's somebody from the past, or sometimes it can be a horrible shape with claws. You get all kinds of images of the critic. The next question we say is, what does the critic actually feel about you? When you see it criticizing you, telling you you're too fat and you should be doing this, or whatever it is, what emotions does it have for you? And it turns out that for most people, the critic is angry, contemptuous, disappointed, okay? And then we say, so now sit there for a moment, watching your critic criticize you with all those emotions that it feels about you. How are you feeling? And then people say, oh, I don't feel very good. I, I, I feel bad, really. So then you can say, so tell me then, does your critic have your best intentions at heart? Does it want to see you do well? Does it put an arm under your shoulder when you fall over? They say, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so the point is, when we take people through this little exercise, they very quickly see that actually... Self-criticism that's associated with hostile emotions like anger and contempt is always going to make you feel better. So, the next question you ask is... And when you say hostile emotions, you mean uh, internally directed hostile emotions. Yeah. 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 So you hear, you hear it as an angry voice or a contemptuous voice. You know, you should be doing this. Come on, Rick, what the hell's the matter with you? Pull yourself together. You know, that kind of ba-ba-ba voice... Right? Now, that hostile voice is going to be stimulating your threat system. The only thing you're going to feel is bad. Now, you might say, okay, I'm going to try harder, I'll try harder, like a child is being threatened. Right? So to underline again something you just said, Paul, that this threat system that largely evolved to deal with external threats, 
you know, yeah. lions chasing zebras, what have you, or angry yeah. members of our primate band, uh, yeah. it gets activated based on internal threat messages of yeah. hostile emotions of self-hatred or self-anger or self-contempt. Um, great. And then people either think they deserve it or that it's helpful to them in some way. So the first thing is to try to the best that we can to help people recognize that that kind of hostile feeling towards yourself is never going to help you. It's not going to take you anywhere except feeling bad. And if you really want to, uh, you know, feel better, it's good to do good things in the world, not just sitting around bashing yourself on the head. So the next question is, so what part of the self would really like to see you do well, to see you at your best, to help you cope with setbacks, to pick you up when you fall over, to ensure that actually rather than getting carried away with driving threat, you can actually learn how to calm down, to soothe yourself, to treat yourself well, to be more content with how you are at, at right now. And it turns out, of course, that's your compassionate self. So then we say, okay, so we're going to build the compassionate self. We're not going to we're not going to fight with the critical self. We're just going to build this compassionate self. And the, the sad thing is, really, is that everybody knows this. Because we say to them, well, look, if, I, if you have a child that you love, right, and you go to two schools, and in one of the schools they say, give me your child. And every time they make a mistake and they don't do very well, we're going to criticize them. We're going to be angry. We're going to show contempt for them. They're going to be so frightened of making it mistakes that they're just going to drive themselves into the ground give us your child and then you go to the other school and they say give us your child and we're going to help them feel joyful pursuit of trying to be their best they can when they make mistakes we're going to teach them how to treat themselves kindly to be open so they can learn so the mistakes become an opportunity not to be feared we're going to help them to be encouraged to develop the confidence to do what they want to do so which school are you going to send your kid? Well, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. We all know that. So the point about it is that people often think that compassion is about being soft and, and uh, letting yourself off the hook. It's absolutely the opposite. Compassion is the real desire to be at your best, to help people as best as you can, to help yourself as best you can, to deal with this crazy brain that we've got, we've talked about earlier on. Compassion is not about being soft. If you have agoraphobia, okay, compassion isn't sitting at home watching television because that's easy. Compassion is, okay, I'm going to do what I can to get better. I'm going to do what I can to get It's the courageous moving towards suffering and trying to do something about it. So, so okay, you want to keep going about how to build up this inner compassion itself? Yeah. So, uh, so we've agreed then that the critical self probably is not a self you want to be uh, keeping hold of. It'll come because the threat system is an automatic system. You know, we get, you know, we do feel bad about ourselves from time to time. And certainly we can be frustrated with our behavior. If you do things like you knock over a tin of paint across your new floor that you've just laid or whatever, that's frustrating. You think, oh gosh, you know. But the self-criticism that does the damage is the one that's really about the self, this feeling that there's something wrong with the self. It's not just a behavior that you've done, you're a bit irritated with, it's about the self. So we don't engage too much of that. What we do is we say, let's think about the self that you would ideally like to be, right? The self that feels in control, the self that actually is able to deal with your inner anger or your inner anxiety. This is a self that would have wisdom, right? Wouldn't be stupid. It would be very wise. It understands that we have a crazy brain most of the time. We have a lot of emotions that are very difficult. We didn't put them there. They've been put there by evolution. It would be a self that would have a sense of strength and authority. It would have a self that could be at a point of stillness, right? It would be a self that's deeply committed to the um, care and validation and helpfulness of self and others. That's the kind of self that we want to build. So we just teach people ways in which they can just learn to practice focusing on that kind of self, learning how to generate kind voices in their head. There's only, if there's one thing, only one thing that you remember from this talk, 
try to the best of your ability to create a kind voice in your own head. Whenever you talk to yourself, whenever you think about yourself, try to have a kind voice rather than a hostile one. If you do that one thing, that will help you. So we build this idea of this becoming a compassionate self, which, of course, in Buddhism is bodhicitta, and gradually always coming back to that. The other thing we teach, as you know, is a lot of breathing exercises because the breathing is a way of slowing down. So we slow the breath, try to get to about six to, uh, six, five to six breaths per minute is ideal, a little deeper, a little longer, and this experience of slowing and slowing, and within that create the sense of there being this point of stillness from which blossoms this compassionate self that's going to be able to become a point of wisdom for you. Great. So we, we have, uh, un, unfortunately, probably only about five or six or seven or so more minutes and so many more things we could talk about. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the last thing you, you did there. So experientially, people could encourage uh, a self-kind voice. Uh, you know, classically, as you know, there's this model of sort of the inner child, critical parent, nurturing parent, or beleaguered self. Uh, persecutor, perpetrator, rescuer, protector, right? Uh, I think of it a little bit as the compassion committee over here. I want to build up my compassion committee so that it has multiple strong characters in it, ranging from that kind of pudgy fairy godmother and Sleeping Beauty Disney film, uh, all the way to kind of a firm but very caring coach who kind of prods us to, you know, try harder next time. No worries, but keep going, you know, that kind of thing. So you're, you've talked about how it's good to develop that inner kind voice. And you also just talked about building up more capacity for, let's say, tranquility, kind of with well-being, not tranquility freezing in fear, but tranquility with well-being. How do you put those two together? this last thing you just did there, this internal kindness with tranquility. Why are those important to come together? Well, it's because that's bringing together the parasympathetic system. So what With we, the contentment system. With the contentment system, yeah. You're trying to create that. Now, compassion is not always about contentment because, you know, if you see a baby in a burning building, you're in a state of alarm then, and you rush in to save the baby. You're not kind of walking calmly. But nevertheless, when you're doing the work for yourself, you're practicing, you want to try to bring these things together. And the reason why that's important is because if you learn to slow down with the breath and you focus on the body becoming grounded, because when you slow the breath, you feel your body getting heavier in the chair, so you feel that sense of grounding. You try to find a point of stillness in your solar plexus area, so just focusing on that. And then imagining being the kind of person you would ideally want to be in terms of this wise, compassionate, focused person. Pardon me, without tipping into the ego ideal of the person you'd want to be, who's this unrealistically perfect one that you feel like you're continually falling short of, right? That's such an important point, right? The point about it is, is that compassion is for the bad stuff. It's not for the good stuff, right? Compassion needs comes when you have to confront your anger, when you have to confront your anxiety, when you have to confront your fear that you might be unlovable or that you've got a drug problem, whatever it is. Compassion is what holds you in suffering. So people often think compassion is about getting rid of the bad stuff and ascending up. You know, this, I am such a compassionate person, I am constantly tranquil. No, it is not that. Compassion is the place that you go to in order to calm down, in order to deal with the stuff that's painful for you. Yeah. So, for example, when we're dealing with people who have been traumatized, we create this experience of compassion before we go anywhere near the trauma. Because if those individuals don't have the compassion for capacity for slowing down, feeling compassion in the body, feeling that sense of deep commitment to be healing, and you take them into trauma, they haven't got anything to kind of help them in the trauma memory. But if they go in and they can imagine bringing their compassion self to the trauma and just thinking about how they want to deal with that trauma from this wise, compassionate position, this is much, much more helpful in our view. So whenever you're in a difficulty, you know, you're having a panic or whatever it is, just try to take the breath and just to remind yourself that 
if I could bring my compassionate self to bear right now, okay, how would I like to be? And to the best of your ability, start to try to be what your idea would be. Now, as you say, you're not always going to make it, but it's there to help you. Right, and with repetition, it's a kind of learning. In a sense, we've right. learned to be internally self-critical or self-shaming, self-disdainful, and we yep. can alternately learn and build up the neural substrates of, really, uh, this more of an internalized quality of being on our own side, being self-nurturing, realistically encouraging, kind and sweet, much as we are to other people, uh, we would be to ourselves. Yes, absolutely right. And it's it's having this inner, inner recognition that actually our brains are very easy to uh, put into loops of anger and anxiety and violence and all kinds of things. It's We often make the point, you know, that if I had been kidnapped as a three-day-old baby, this version of Paul Gilbert wouldn't exist. If I'd been taken and brought up in a violent drug gang, I would probably be dead now or in prison and might have harmed people. So this sense of self that we have is totally created by our social context, right? So you, you've got a brain you never chose. It's full of stuff you never chose. You've got a sense of self you never chose. It really isn't your fault. But if you make a decision, even though it's not my fault, I want to do something about it, how can I go about that? Well, I need to learn how to slow down. I need to focus on my intention. My intention is to try to bring some compassion to all this stuff. Mm. If you do that, then you're in a much better position to start to work with some of the real difficulties that our brain throws up for us. So as you well know, compassion is all about intention, intention, intention. Always coming back to the intention. What is your intention? What would you want to become? And work towards that. And I think your colleague Richie Davidson points out that if you want to be a piano player, if you really want to be a piano player, the thing to do is to practice every day. And the point about the self is that if we practice every day, it gets easier and easier because we keep remembering, we keep remembering, we keep slowing. We learn how to generate the kind of voice. We learn how to how to keep a facial expression of kindness. And that gradually, gradually seeps into us a bit by bit. So That's as you beautiful. say, it's a matter of practice, yeah. That's great. Well, Paul, we just uh, have a few more minutes and I, I wondered if I could ask you two questions uh, that I ask everyone. Uh, so, uh, you'll have to uh, take a crack at them that's fairly succinct. Uh, the first is, uh, if you don't mind saying, uh, what's your own growing edge these days? Obviously, you've internalized a lot of uh, what you practice. Uh, my Compassion Committee is now going to have Paul Gilbert on it, you know, giving me good counsel and encouragement and, and a lot of warmth and kindness. Uh, so. You, that said, uh, what's your growing edge? What are you still working on? What are you trying to help yourself learn your way into, even even now? Um, I suppose, it's mm, a great question. One of the things that I suppose is that as I move through my 60s, becoming more aware of the fragility of my life, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more and more people that I've known are starting to die. So one of the things that I'm, thinking about more deeply now is the nature of the ending of life and uh, that's proving quite interesting uh, and also the nature of suffering in the universe right so that, as you know the Buddhists have the four noble truths but the evolutionary story is also very interesting and the question is is there a spiritual question in this because the the birth of consciousness or at least the birth of consciousness of consciousness is extremely painful but there is something that happens at the point of the birth of consciousness which is an also an opportunity to wake up to the fact that it's very painful that you know all life eats life all life depends on other life for its own existence we can become aware of that and by becoming choosing the path of compassion we can kind of look back on life in other words humans are the one species that can become compassionate to the suffering of evolution because evolution is a very very harsh mistress indeed so i'm very interested in that element within myself because i don't i didn't mention this to you before but one of the things that put me into compassion was anger um because when i was a young man i was brought up in a very religious uh, background 
you know, God makes us all wonderful and it's only Adam and Eve that's messed it up and it's because of our sin and all that, had all the rest. And then when I came across evolution, I thought, my God, it's a mess. <laughs> the design is terrible. It's shocking, you know. So there was kind of all the suffering, you know, the people, the diseases that people get, the viruses that they get, the way they get blind and have strokes, and the children who die of these horrible things. And uh, so that was my kind of how I could deal with the waking up to the reality of suffering as almost pointless and meaningless, just the drive for life, you know. And it was compassion that helped me begin to recognize, but in waking up to this, there, you, you can stay angry and it's all ridiculous, or you can recognize that also what wakes up is the compassionate intent. The compassion of what? Intent, the motivation, the, bodhicha, the bodhisattva, if you like, also wakes up. Okay, so you, you, the anger can stay, but if you can get this compassion itself to recognize, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Life is full of suffering, and it isn't people's faults. And if I had been brought up in that background, I would be a murderer too. It, you, you have this empathy for the way things really are, but also a real wish to try to do what you can to help people see this. And it's not your fault. It really is not your fault or the stuff that goes on in your mind. But if you can be compassionate to it, if you have an intention to be compassionate to others in the world, this will help you. And that, for me, has been a wonderful journey and a journey that I'm still on. Wow, that's great. And when you talked about the Buddhist notion of the bodhisattva or bodhisattva, um, it's a kind of, uh, you know, it's a being who uh, is very benevolent, uh, profoundly benevolent. And you're talking about both self-benevolence, the awakening of self-benevolence, as well as the application of those qualities of benevolence to others as well. So it's yeah. internally directed compassion, externally directed compassion, partly informed and motivated, using your word of intention, by some recognition of evolution. And yeah. um, probably implicit in that would be your answer to the, my last question, which is, one minute here, if you had a magic wand and could get some critical mass number of human brains on the planet, call it a billion brains, uh, if you could get a billion brains every day doing something inside their own minds uh, that would have a lot of impact uh, for a few minutes or less, uh, maybe even spread out over the course of the day, what would be your Paul Gilbert, one thing that you think could make a really big difference for humanity? Okay, well, <laughs> that's a great question. Mark. One first, minute. One thing. The first thing is to learn to slow down and learn to look at yourself and people around you and realize that we're all here. We're all part of the evolutionary story. Okay, we're part of the flow of life on this planet, in this universe. That everybody around you has the potential seed for compassion within them. Everybody around you has the potential for the opposite. Everybody around you has the potential for happiness and also great suffering. Okay? So the point is, how do we now interact together, recognizing that we're all in this together? Nobody is different from that. We're all here together. And that by reaching out to each other, um, we can make this journey a little easier. Well, very beautiful. Thank you. Um, so, Paul Gilbert, uh, professor of clinical psychology uh, and author of the book uh, Mindful Compassion uh, from New Harbinger, really quite an exceptional book and really altogether, Paul, here, uh, an exceptional man. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to be talking with you and um, to be creating the opportunity really for more people to be really exposed to uh, your mind, uh, but in particular exposed to your heart. So thank you very much for being with us here. Well, it's been a delight. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Rick. That's great. Okay, take care. And you.